Hey, I'm Fight the Flyer, and welcome back to the channel that fills stupidity's pockets with rocks and throws it in the ocean. Today, it's time for Jaronism to get the more traditional Flurfs are Idiots treatment. There was already a two hour long live episode, but that is now on mine and Team Skeptic's new channel, Science or Satire. Here's Team Skeptic to tell you all about it. Hey guys, and welcome to today's video, Flurfs are Idiots Volume 10. But before we get into Fight the Flat Earth's Masterpiece, I'd like to talk a little bit about the new channel that he and I have recently started, Science or Satire. The Science or Satire channel is a new channel dedicated to a little bit of science and a whole lot of satire. So come join us for a unique YouTube watching experience and play along with our live stream fuckery with interviews with your favorite debunkers, audience engaging segments like My Buddy's an Idiot, Today in Science, and Birthday Power Rankings, and live debunking of Flat Earth and other pseudoscience videos you wish you'd never seen. But don't worry though, this won't change the content coming from either of our channels. The Science or Satire channel is simply an alternate way for you guys to have a good laugh at the expense of someone else's stupidity. So head over there now and click the subscribe button. Our first episode with Red's Rhetoric is already up, so give it a watch, smash that thumbs up button, and leave a comment. So if you're ready for Flurfs or Idiots Part 10, click that thumbs up button and let's begin. We're living on a disc, floating through space, with a tiny sun. Fight the Fight the Fight the So a while ago, Jism released this video responding to a website called IFL Science. So let's take a trip through the mind of a man who's known to the rest of the world as Red's Rhetoric's bitch. So the problem with this whole thing, if you ask me, is that you would think that they could mention other reasons that people are flat earthers. Well, first off, Jism, I didn't ask you. And the main reason people are flat earthers is that flat earthers are fucking idiots. You know, like the fact that NASA has been lying about going to the moon for 50 years. You know, the fact that they took more photos on the moon than is even possible. Even when you multiply it out by the amount of people on the moon, the amount of time they were on the moon, you take all the images, take in the time that they were on video that we know of, and they would have been taking photos at a rate of like one every 10 seconds the rest of the time they're on the moon. Completely and totally impossible. Ignoring the fact that in that clip there was an image that said the moon didn't start glowing until 1977, I think we should take a look at Jism's math skill. He says that they would have needed to take one photo every 10 seconds that they were on the moon. Well, the Apollo 11 crew took a total of 122 photos whilst on the lunar surface outside of their landing module. They spent two and a half hours on the EVA, so that's 9,000 seconds. So we divide 9,000 by 122 and we get 78. That's one picture every one minute and 18 seconds, but there was two of them. So that means on average, they took one picture about every two minutes, 40 seconds. So just for you, Jism, 10 is less than 168. Or that water always finds its level. Or the fact- Level does not mean flat. Stop using these words interchangeably. Stop it. Or the fact that surveyors don't take perspective into account even though we know 100% that things appear to get smaller with distance. Or that we- Alpha equals two times the arctan of G over two R. Alpha is the angular size of an object. G is the actual size of the object. R is the distance to the object. As an object gets further away from you, it will appear to shrink in your vision. And the reason that this is a problem for the flat earth is because that doesn't happen to the fucking <laughs> sun. Or they don't mention the Chicago skyline where the globe calls for the buildings to be hidden completely. But we can look at the uh, skunk bay footage, the time-lapse footage, and see how weather affects our views of distant shores and how atmospheric effects can account for everything that we see and everything that we can't. Pretty sure Jism answered his own question there. Yes, weather conditions can affect the amount of atmospheric refraction, which is why seeing the Chicago skyline is... Is a mirage. It's just like density and buoyancy can ex completely explain gravity. No, it really can't. Tell me, how does a warship float? The warship is a lot denser than the ocean. Or if I place a heavy metal ball on top of a wooden table, why doesn't it sink through the table? Or the fact that our atmosphere is a pressure gradient going from 14.7 psi to 0 psi. 
So if things were going to go through the less dense medium when we let go of them, they would go up. And the only thing they can't explain, of course, is how the Earth became a sphere. No, gravity, this unseen force, must exist because everything must pull to the center. It's required by the model that has been built on for hundreds of years. He did it again, said how we can't explain how the Earth became a sphere, but then explained it himself with... Gravity, you fucking retard! Gravity! Have you ever heard of fucking gravity? Gravity! Gravity! Uh, how about ignore asteroids and meteors, or... Ignore asteroids and meteors. Are you sure that's a good idea? It didn't work out too well for the dinosaurs. Uh, who chooses which gravity? Einsteinian, where it a, uh, isn't a pull force, but a push force because mass bends the fabric of space-time? Mm-hmm. Or is it Newtonian gravity? Which one are we actually looking at? This particular argument is one I'm having with dumb fuck of the year frontrunner Sleeping Warrior. He says the same, that you have to choose between Newton or Einstein. Well, that's complete bollocks because Newton and Einstein both describe the same thing. The curvature of space-time by mass is manifested within our understanding of Newtonian physics as an apparent accelerating force. Uh, don't mention that NASA trains in a pool, as if this training was anything like space, with somebody swimming behind you carrying all your cords and handing you all your tools. Yeah, sure. Don't mention that NASA train in the environment that can give them the best approximation of zero G. Sure, but Jism? Where would you suggest they train to go into space? Do you happen to have some handy anti-gravity technology chambers we don't know about? Uh, don't mention the uh, $53 million a day. That might be a little bit too much for people to grasp. Like, what do you mean? Who gets $53 million a day? NASA does. What do they do with it? I don't know. Launch rockets about once a month into the sky. They go pretty. And then they do a sonic boom from the sky and people like Red's Rhetoric have an orgasm. Oh, that's the only thing I really noticed. Well, first off, you moron. Your graphic there says 52 million and not 53. And what do they do with it? Well, first off, they send shit to space and that costs a lot of money. The Parker Solar Probe, for instance, currently on its way to the sun, that alone cost $1.5 billion. They also have over 18,000 employees, a lot of which are, you know, rocket scientists that, that need paying. The fact that, hey, you know when boats go away, they disappear behind what looks like the horizon to your eye, pull out your camera, zoom in, and there's the boat again. Yeah, imagine that. It didn't actually go over any curve, did it? They don't mention that. Jism, um, if a boat comes into view when you zoom in on it, that's because it hasn't gone over the curve yet. Keep your silly little P900 zoomed in and watch that boat go over the curve then. It's not coming back. Uh, Coriolis. We have a problem with Coriolis. It does not exist on a spinning planet with an attached spinning atmosphere. Wouldn't make any sense. Or... This is a mass flow meter. It uses the Coriolis effect to create vibrations as a fluid passes through it and is an extremely accurate at measuring the mass flow and density of fluids. It literally wouldn't work if the Coriolis effect wasn't a thing. But or they tell you that you can easily see the 240,000 mile distant moon, which is a joke in and of itself. Uh, even though the inverse square law tells us that the uh, light on the moon would be about at a thousand miles from the moon, the light of the moon should be 65,000 times as bright as it is from Earth. Give me a break. It's impossible. Go watch the moon landing films and tell me those guys are standing on something that is 65,000 times as bright as we see it from Earth. No freaking way. It's a lie. It's all a joke. I wish you would take a break, at least from YouTube. I think I'm losing IQ points answering these stupid ass questions. The moon only reflects at most about 13.6% of instant sunlight. And it's only one 380,000th of the magnitude of the sun. So, we can get into, I mean, there's so many more. They didn't bring up the Foucault pendulum, which of course is their proof of the Earth spinning when it wouldn't even possibly work if the atmosphere moved along with Earth. Think, people. Use your heads. Use our heads? Ha, <laughs> mate, it's all right. Your buddy Bob proved the Earth spin quite nicely, but shh, it's confidential. Anyway, that's enough of jism for me right now. I'm going to pass you over to Team Skeptic for more evidence that Jism is the king of the idiots. A while ago, when talking about planes traveling in the Southern Hemisphere, I stated that those passenger planes could be traveling faster than the speed of sound and actually be traveling much greater distances without anyone knowing. My reason for this was, of course, the jet streams. And what happened? Well, when I said it, I was laughed at and told it was impossible for passenger planes to travel faster than the speed of sound. Jism, you're a fucking idiot. It is impossible for average commercial planes to travel faster than the speed of sound 
relative to the atmosphere around them. This is almost completely due to the plane's aerodynamics and the atmospheric drag. Now you might think that you can just go up in altitude to reduce the atmospheric drag, but that also removes the available oxygen for the engines to maintain their thrust. So the height and path an airliner takes is calculated for maximum efficiency. If you're flying east today, you're in a whole lot of luck. The jet stream, that funny little channel of high altitude air that flows over the United States and Northern Atlantic, is moving at unheard of speeds, delivering commercial jets to their destinations nearly an hour ahead of schedule, the Washington Post reports. In fact, one Virgin Atlantic flight traveling from Los Angeles to London notched a speed of 801 miles per hour over Pennsylvania, which, had it been on the ground, would have been faster than the speed of sound. Which is exactly what we've been saying all along. Speed is relative. In the case of an airplane, there are two speeds that can be measured. One is the airspeed, or the speed of the aircraft relative to the air around it. And the other is the ground speed, or the speed of the aircraft relative to the ground. The 801 miles per hour measured was its ground speed, which is relative to a stationary surface. However, it still wouldn't have traveled faster than the speed of sound if the atmosphere around it was also traveling at extreme speeds and in the same direction, no matter how close to the surface it gets. The speed of sound is completely relative to the speed of the medium sound travels through and has nothing to do with the ground speed unless the atmosphere is stationary relative to the ground. All right, so let's go through it and pull out a few important parts. First, you have to be traveling east, which is the same way that the Earth spins. So remember, you're spinning a 1,000 miles per hour, and so the atmosphere, which is attached to the Earth, and the winds are all moving 250 miles per hour or faster. And why do I say faster? Hold that thought. But remember that these winds are blowing faster than even the spin of the Earth in the same direction. We are not about to go into the dynamics of the jet streams here. However, I will give you a basic answer to Jism's stupidity. The speeds of the jet streams are dependent upon the temperature differences between the atmosphere around the equator and the atmosphere around the poles. The greater these differences in temperatures are, the faster the jet streams will be. And the easterly direction of the jet streams is direct evidence of the spin of the Earth. Just as with the Coriolis effect, the warmer air from the equator rushes to the poles and carries along with it its greater tangential velocities, causing them to drift east relative to the stationary surface. Jism's a science-denying idiot, so I don't think he's going to get this. So take a basketball, have an attached atmosphere, spin it, and then try to make the winds go faster than the spinning basketball in the same direction. Ridiculous. Jism, you're dumb as fuck. The average human sneeze travels at about 100 miles per hour. So if you're on a plane that's traveling at 500 miles per hour and you sneeze, does the sneeze go backwards in your mouth? No, you idiot, because the speed of the sneeze, just like the speed of the winds, is relative to the atmosphere around it. So it's not ridiculous to think that a pocket of atmosphere moving at any speed could generate pressure differentials within that pocket that will result in additional pockets of atmosphere moving at slightly faster speeds relative to the atmosphere surrounding it. Also note that it says that the jet streams can reach speeds up to 250 miles per hour or greater. <laughs> That's just funny. Up to 250 miles per hour or greater? Okay, uh, well, my feeble mind says that up to 250 miles per hour then is an incorrect statement if they can also be greater. You know, my car can hold up to five people or greater. Well, which is it? Well, at least you got the feeble mind part right. Up to 250 miles per hour could be the average top speed of the jet streams with gusts that could exceed that but not normally. As for your Honda hatchback that seats five people example, you're not taking into account that if we have someone sit in every person's lap except the driver, we have now put nine people in a car that holds up to five people. So which is it? Can your car hold five idiots or more? And so this is just a little quick example that I made here. Uh, let's say we've got a plane going Sydney to Santiago as we just showed. That travels 7,000 miles in 12 hours, which is about the average flight time. 7,000 divided by 12 equals 583 miles per hour. All right, but what about the jet stream? So remember, it's helping the plane with close to 250 mile per hour winds. So if the plane is being helped, well, 583 miles per hour minus 250, is the plane actually going 333 miles per hour? And then it's getting the extra 250 to end up at 583? Well, that doesn't sound very efficient, does it? This goes back to what I was saying previously. 
The overall efficiency of the flight is dependent upon many variables, but for this example we will only take into account thrust and atmospheric drag. If by raising the altitude you reduce the atmospheric drag enough that the corresponding reduction in thrust generated by the engine still results in a higher ground speed, then the flight as a whole is more efficient. However, if the tailwinds generated by the jet streams are not strong enough, then it is more efficient to fly lower where the drag is higher, but the thrust generated by the engine is greater as well. So let's look at it this way. What if that plane was actually going 625 miles per hour, which we saw, ground speed. We also know that that's easily under the speed of sound. 625 miles per hour plus 250 miles per hour, which would be the most efficient thing, is 875 miles per hour ground speed. Okay. So a plane from Sydney to Santiago could be going 875 miles per hour for 12 hours. 875 times 12 is 10,500 miles instead of 7,000 miles. I mean, quite a difference, right? When people do what Jism just did and say something really fucking stupid on the internet, I feel compelled to respond. So Jism, you're a fucking idiot. If a plane is traveling, as you said, at a ground speed of 625 miles per hour, and as you stated earlier, the max speeds of the jet streams are 250 miles per hour, and you added that speed to the original 625 miles per hour, you have essentially stated that the airspeed around the plane at 625 miles per hour ground speed is at best zero miles per hour, because you decided to be dishonest and add the 250 miles per hour per hour as if the original airspeed was zero miles per hour. So until it gets into the 250 mile per hour jet stream, the air must be carrying the plane around at 625 miles per hour, which is faster than the 250 miles per hour you asserted to be the max speed of the jet streams to begin with. Even if somehow math decided to change on its own, you are still making the assumption that the airplane was in 250 mile per hour tailwinds the entire time, which also wouldn't be true. You can try as hard as you want to make things work in your favoritism, but every time you open your mouth, you sound like a moron. So please remember, I'm not trying to make any new claims here. As I've claimed in the past, the planes can go faster than the speed of sound. We've just seen that now in the article. You see what I'm saying? You open your mouth and you sound like an idiot. Planes can have a ground speed that is higher than the ground speed of a sound wave propagating through a relatively stationary medium, but planes themselves are not breaking the sound barrier. Think of it like this. How fast must a plane travel before the people on the inside of the cabin can no longer hear each other talking? The answer is, there isn't one, because sound is a mechanical wave, and the speed of sound is relative to the speed of the medium it is traveling in. And as I always say, it's up to you to decide. You can choose. If you don't think that we've ever been lied to, then good for you. I'm smarter than that. I'm smarter than that. <laughs> well, thanks for that fiber skeptic don't forget to subscribe to the team skeptic channel next up let's take a look at one of the experiments that jism did to try and prove that there is no curve on earth the following footage is taken from the documentary behind the curve which you can watch on netflix or amazon prime we join jism in a backup experiment as his first at disproving a curve with a laser was a massive fail you really should watch a documentary because this is my favorite bit. I've been brainwashed and I keep hitting this button for splashdown sequence and nothing happens. Start, start. Yeah. So this is about $30 to get in per person, give or take. Everything, Everything is so run down. Everything's worn. Everything is kind of broken. Chris Pontius could teach this place. So anyway, let's take a look at Jizen's backup experiment. You have a backup experiment. If you're seeing through this hole, through the next hole, and seeing the light at the backboard or at 17 feet off the water, the earth is flat. If he's holding it up at 23 feet high and we're seeing the light, well, that's because the earth's curved. So I, I should only be able to see it when it's at 17 feet. OK, go ahead and drive down there, Enrique. You're going to hold the light there. Enrique, how high is your light? 17 feet. I mean, I you know, it's as 
There's, we don't see you, Enrique. Lift up your lift up your light up, way above your head. If he's holding it up at 23 feet high and we're seeing the light, well, that's because the Earth's curved. Interesting. Ooh. Interesting there. That's interesting. Yo, Interesting indeed, and to celebrate this moment, you can get yourself an interesting t-shirt now. There's 25% off until Monday. And that is all for today. But before I go, I want to say a massive thanks to my patrons. Your support allows me to focus as much time as possible on my channel. To join, go to patreon.com FTFE. If you've enjoyed this video, please leave a thumbs up. And if you're not already, subscribe and get that notification bell on so you never miss anything from FTFE. I'll be back later this weekend with episode 11 of Flurfs Are Idiots and episode 9 of Flurfs Say What. Remember, stupidity is not a right. Fight the flatter. Fight the flat. Fight the flat. Fight the flat. Fight the fight the fight. Fight the flat. 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 Fight the fight the fight. Fight the flat. Fight the flat. Fight the flat. Fight the flat.